Hey, hey, triple students. So we were looking at uh, the eye and the brain, and now we're going to look at thermoregulation as part of the homeostasis model. Model, it's not a model, the homeostasis topic. So this is, again, paper two. Um, these are things you need to know. How the body loses and gains heat, how temperature is maintained, and explain why it's important to maintain a constant body temperature. This is going to lead us on to talk about the kidneys and also dialysis. And also then we're going to move on and talk about plant hormones. And then that is all of the hormone stuff uh, for biology paper two. And then I will move on to another topic. OK, so let's get cracking. So thermoregulation, let's break down that word. The word thermo means heat and regulation means maintain or keep the same um, in the same way that homeostasis means uh, to maintain a constant internal environment. So let's get cracking. So let's see what you already know. Now, you might want to take a little pause here. In fact, definitely do pause it and see if you can verbally out loud answer these questions. OK, have a read of them. Um, I'm going to go through all the answers to these, but you need to um, be able to verbally answer these with quite a lot of confidence before you can say, yeah, I definitely know this. So let's have a look at what you already know. So which process produces heat in every living cell? I hope we'd know that one. Um, which organ of the body produces the most heat? How is heat transferred around the body? What should your core temperature be? What happens if it drops below? What happens if it goes above 40? Suggest three ways your body can lose heat. What happens to the rate of enzyme action as the reaction mixture is heated up? Why are enzymes important in the body? And when you fry an egg, what happens to the egg white and why? I like this. It's a bit of a fun link. Um, we're going to go through the answers in a few slides time, but I definitely, you should at least jot down something that you know, because then you can see, oh, actually, even at the end of this, while you're at home and you might not think anything's going in, you can actually check and test whether you have taken some things in. So these pictures, what do they tell you? Now, this is um, a, these images are called uh, thermographs and you are performing thermography. And as you can see, we've got different colors indicate different amounts of heat that is being emitted from an object. Now, heat is always emitted uh, from an object or absorbed by an object. So try and use the right turn of phrase. What do these pictures tell you? Again, thermograms, uh, this one's using, you can see the one of the seal is using a thermocan and you can see actually you've got quite high um, high levels of heat in, in uh, being emitted from the face in the seal um, and again from the elephant in the large ears and you might be able to link this to adaptations within the animal we use uh, thermo cameras for lots of things for identifying things but also if you can identify areas of heat emission from the body quite often you can then find um, uh, you can diagnose an issue within the body um, I personally because I because I've worked with horses so much know that they some people use um, thermocams to check for areas of soreness in the back to see if a saddle fits correctly that kind of thing um, Right, let's go through our answers. The process that produces heat in every living cell is respiration. Had you been in class, there is a worksheet um, so you can fill it in. I will attach that to this as well. Um, which organ of the body produces the most heat? It's the liver. So lots of metabolism happens in the liver. Um, lots of reactions occurring. How is heat transferred around the body? Now, this one... I don't like the answer particularly on the PowerPoint. Um, I think you can go a bit further with this, but conduction, convection, radiation, and evaporation is how heat is transferred through the body, out of the body. Um, but heat is also transferred via the blood also, because obviously you're doing a lot of respiration, emitting a load of heat. And the first place it actually reaches is your blood. And so you've sort of got your own um, hot water system <laughs> moving around your body. Core temperature should be anywhere between 36 and 37 and a half degrees. Um, that's normal temperature. If it goes above that, we'd, or, or above that, we'd say that somebody had a fever. Um, what happens if your body temperature drops below 35? You would have something called hypothermia. This means your enzymes would be working slower, so they wouldn't be as active, which means that metabolism in your body would be slower. Um, a rise in body temperature would result in something called hyperthermia, or heat stroke is what we would know it as. And at this point, our enzymes are going to start creeping towards denaturing, which mean, can be very, very dangerous. Um, ways in which your body can lose heat. There are there are three here. So it can lose heat through the skin. About 10% of your body heat is lost via conduction. Um, evaporation of sweat. Again, um, the movement of heat out of your body is convection generally because it's moving from an area of hot to an area of cold where it's cooling down. Um, and when we breathe out, we actually breathe out quite a lot of water vapour and warm air when we breathe out. And we know that because we warm up our hands by going <gasps> in the winter, don't we? Um, 
Uh, what happens to the ray of enzyme action if a reaction mi mixture is heated up? Oh, I forgot this, sorry. Waste and feces is another way we get rid of, uh, get rid of. This is heat. Um, as the temperature increase, enzyme reaction is increased until it gets to its beyond its optimum and then it can denature. Um, enzymes are important in the body because all living set, all chemical reactions are controlled by enzymes. So they are catalysts that speed those up. So they're very, very important. And when you fry an egg, what happens to the egg white? So it turns white, so it changes color. Um, oh, those reactions called metabolism. Oh, sorry. So why does the egg change uh, color? I don't know if this is re recorded over what I've just said, so I'm sorry if you're hearing me repeat it. So it changes color because the um, egg whites are, the proteins in the egg are denatured, which causes branches to be linked between the amino acids in the egg white, and that causes them to connect and change color at high temperatures. Let's move on. So why has this person, why has this th thermogram changed? Well, you can, can suggest this. Um, this is a, a using your knowledge. So my suggestion would be, well, he's probably um, em, he's probably um, done some exercise, and therefore he is emitting more heat. Okay, so when we're maintaining our constant body temperature, we must ensure that all heat losses and heat gains are constant um, against your body temperature. Um, and this is regulated when we did the brain. We spoke about how the hypoth hypothalamus regulates this. It's not something you think about. It does it. Um, or automatically. Um, and this links the endocrine system to so the hormone system to the nervous system. Um, and it controls hunger, um, attachment behaviours, thirst, fatigue, sleep, circadian rhythms, um, and body temperature. That's not ideal there, is it? Okay. So, the thermoregulatory sensor center in the hypothalamus senses the temperature of the blood throwing, <laughs> I can't talk, flowing through the hypothalamus. And obviously you've got a lot of nerves um, and receptors in your skin anyway that also are going to enable you um, to detect the outside world. Um, um, and they're going to carry those impulses. Remember, they jump synapse to synapse. Um, and the core body temperature starts to rise, the hypothalamus will trigger responses which increase the heat losses. I'm really sorry about the formatting on this. Um, if the core body temperature starts to fall, the hypothalamus triggers responses which either generate heat um, or reduce the amount of heat that's being lost. But let's talk about vasodilation and vasoconstriction. This is one of the things that the hypothalamus um, can kick into gear. So we have capillaries. They, they are small blood vessels, one cell thick, that move from our arteries to our veins, but they also enable us to transport um, substances to and from our cells. And we have some of those close to the skin um, and they are supplied by atrioles or parts of the artery. Um, and we have shunt vessels that sort of bypass the ones that are close to the skin surface, should they be required. Um, and we have smooth muscle that will control the amount of blood flowing to and from those capillaries uh, close to the skin surface. Heat is lost through the skin to the surrounding air. You can see those arrows there showing that heat is being lost by radiation, bit of conduction, but not a lot. Um, if our body temperature gets higher, this will trigger vasodilation. Okay, so you get redder, essentially, I always remember this. So, um, or after after exercise, your face is red and that's because you have got vasodilation going on. So your smooth muscle relaxes um, and your um, arterial dilates. This means that you have more blood running to the capillaries that are close to the surface of the skin. Therefore, you have got um, less blood throw, flowing through the shunt vessels but it means that you've got more blood flowing through those capillaries close to the surface, therefore you've got a greater rate of heat loss. You've got more heat being lost from the surface of the skin. If you are cold, however, it works in exactly the other way, and it's called vasoconstriction. Now, I always think of boa constrictors squeezing. I don't know why. I'm not sure that that helps you particularly. Um, but when it is cold, um, blood is directed away from your skin. And this is called vasoconstriction because you don't want to lose more than you can afford to. So the smooth muscle of the arterial, um, arterial contracts 
constricts the lumen and it therefore stops blood flowing through the capillaries. So more blood is then shunted or goes through the shunt vessel away from the skin and towards your core. Now, your core is the part that you need to stay warmer and so therefore your body's got some really good ways they do i mean if people you know get severely cold really bad hypothermia you'll still find the insides will be warm even if you've got frostbite on the fingers and toes because you, it shuts down inwards less blood flows to the surface to the skin therefore you get less heat loss from the surface of the skin and the rate of heat increases okay now we're going to look at um how your skin um how else your skin can help you um, in terms of heat loss um, or reducing heat loss. I'm noticing that I have got goosebumps on my skin as I'm doing this, despite looking out a really sunny window. Um, so we're going to look at um, pili or pili. I'm not really sure what that is. Erection, which is just goosebumps. OK, so everybody has hairs and hair follicles. Um, well, male and female all um, have the same number of hair follicles, as does someone with lots of hair and thick hair, um, or someone that is bald or not bald. In fact, we have the same number of hair follicles as apes, I do believe. I'm not sure if that's completely true. It's just the thickness of the hair um, is the difference. Um, that's a useless piece of information for you. So each of these hair follicles has um, an erector muscle attached to them, a pili or a pili erector muscle attached to them. Um, and so if the external temperature drops significantly, it doesn't have to be that significant, to be honest, um, then the uh, muscles will contract, causing hairs to stand on end. And quite often a question in the, um, in the exams would be, why? But why? Um, why would the hair stand up right? Why would that be useful? Because we get a layer of insulation between the hairs because air is a very bad conductor and so therefore air will not allow heat to um, to be lost as quickly by conduction. Um, another thing if we're too hot sweating is something we do to lose body heat so um, underneath your skin you have a lot of sweat glands and if the core body temperature starts to rise then the sweat sweat will be secreted to the surface of the skin. Now this water absorbs heat from the body it's then evaporating that evaporation causes quite rapid cooling and that's why wiping sweat off is not necessarily a good idea if you want to get cool um what was i going to say about sweating make sure if you talk about sweat it must you must talk about evaporation that is the cooling i mean a lot of third world countries that can't don't have electricity etc use this process to actually make refrigeration because the evaporation takes heat from a place of a high heat concentration to low through this method using a liquid to absorb the heat and then evaporate. Uh, I don't know whether I've just deleted this if I have I'm really sorry so um, we um, contract our muscles repeatedly so we have more respiration therefore more heat is generated when we shiver. Um, this is an example of a visual way of representing normal body temperature and things we do to get it back to baseline, back to 37 degrees, which is normal. So if your body temperature rises, the changes will be detected by the hypothalamus, <coughs> excuse me, which will be collecting information from um, your sensory receptors. This will trigger those responses such as vasodilation or sweating to reduce it back to normal. If your body temperature falls below, it's de detected by the hypothalamus as it goes through through your brain, which will trigger response such as vasoconstriction or goosebumps or shivering to 